football. I've been watching it for 40 years. Are you kidding me? You're listening to Winning Cures Everything. Game day, baby. Wake up or get out. Here's your host. A confident young man. A superb athlete. Gary Seegers. Welcome in. Winning Cures Everything. It is the Monday, December 5th edition of the show. I am your host, Gary Seegers. You can follow me on Twitter at GaryWCE. Hopefully, everybody had a great weekend. Hopefully, everybody is having a great week thus far. We had a lot happen over the weekend. And you know what? I was not here in Memphis for any of it. Uh, I am actually at home today. Had to come home early from New Orleans because our toddler has strep throat. That's right, so I am staying home with him today. Uh, luckily, no symptoms for me thus far. He is currently down for a nap. That means it is showtime, so it is time for me to knock this stuff out. I was in New Orleans over the weekend. I got uh, I got quite a few bets in down at uh, Harrah's, and uh, and yeah, ended up playing out well. Had a, had a good weekend, of course. If you watched the, uh, the show last week, the analysis show, the Which Way Would I Lean show, uh, I went eight and three against the spread on the Winning Cures Everything show. I went four and zero oh in my best bets on the BetUS show. Not too shabby, not too shabby. I'll tell you all about BetUS in just a minute. But before we do that, let me go on and tell you guys. First off, thank you for watching the show. Second, if you are watching this show live right now, go ahead and in the comments or in the chat, tell me where you are watching the show from. I want to know where everybody is watching from. Please go ahead and toss it in there. Uh, I'm very, very curious where you guys are watching from. I, I see all the analytics. I see the numbers. Uh, I've got the demographics, etc., uh, that YouTube and the podcast and whatnot provide. But I, I would like to hear from you guys. Where are you watching the show today? Toss it in there. Uh, along with that, first, of all, again, thank you. Thank you very much for watching the show. And uh, if you would, so kindly, hit that like button. Make sure that you are subscribed here on Winning Cures Everything, the show is brought to you each and every time out by BetUS. That is America's premier online sports book. It's really been America's favorite sports book since 1994. That's right. They've been around a very, very long time. Incredible customer service. Incredibly fast payouts. Uh, the website is easy to use. I mean, there's all kinds of different things with BetUS. Make sure that you are taking advantage of such a great offer that they've got right now. In the description below, you will see that you can sign up at BetUS with that link right there and get a $50 free play with no deposit required. So make sure that you click that link and go and get signed up because BetUS wants to help you out as we're getting into bowl season, etc. If you haven't used them before, I highly, highly recommend it, and you can use that free play to get a taste of it uh, before you fully commit. That's the easiest way to do it. So go ahead and get signed up over at BetUS. I host the BetUS College Football Show every Tuesday and Wednesday at 1 p.m. Eastern Time. Now, this week it's only going to be on Tuesday because we've only got Army-Navy this week, but we are going to do a little bit of an early preview for the college football playoff uh, games, right, at Georgia, Ohio State, Michigan, and TCU, etc. We're going to talk about the Heisman that's going on this weekend, uh, and we're going to give our bets, give our picks, whatever it may be, on Army-Navy, how we see the game actually breaking down. So... Lots going on over there. Make sure that you are subscribed. Again, there is a link in the description for that as well. Let's move into it, and we're going to make this easy. College football playoff reaction. Oh, of course, on Sunday, they announced that the teams that got in uh, were TCU as the number three seed and Ohio State as the number four seed. We all knew that Georgia and Michigan would be one and two. That was not a surprise. The surprise was TCU, even after a loss in the Big 12 title game, they got in and then Ohio State got in. USC, of course, being bumped out after Caleb Williams suffered an injury early against Utah and USC had no answer for the Utes. It was just a complete debacle. Uh, and I do find it rather funny to see all of these different talking heads discussing who deserves to be in, et cetera, et cetera. Maybe, maybe it's smarter to come at it from the idea of there's only two that really deserve to be in, right? Like, you, you try and talk about who is the most deserving, uh, but at the end of the day, uh, TCU lost their conference championship game. Yes, I understand it was to a team that they already beat, but this is the way that the Big 12 decided to set this up. So... It was to a team that they already beat earlier in the year, granted at home, 
but this was neutral site to a top 10 team. So uh, everybody believes that TCU was the more deserving team to get into the playoff field. And I completely understand that. I'm not, I'm not disparaging at TCU whatsoever. And Ohio State, of course, being number four, well, when you've only got one loss next to your name, uh, that's the way that this playoff uh, committee has decided that they want to do it. They think that uh, even if you did lose in the last game of the season by more than three touchdowns at home, uh, as long as it was to a really good team, you should be okay. And I do understand that. Alabama did not deserve to be in. They were number five in this. Uh, but had they gotten in over Tennessee, uh, yeah, there would have been a lot of people really upset about that. Uh, but the truth of the matter is, Tennessee probably should not have gone on the road late in November and gotten housed by uh, 40 point, 30 points, whatever it was. They gave up 63 points to a South Carolina team that scored zero offensive points at Florida the, the week before, or two weeks before, or whatever it was, right? It, there was nobody really deserving in this. Now, the team that really really might have an issue here is Clemson. And they had plenty of opportunities to put in Cade Klubnik late in this season. And they didn't do it. And this was Dabo maybe being a bit hard-headed. I understand why he is fiercely loyal to his guys. That is his brand. That's what they do. That is what they believe in. But it was very apparent at multiple points this season that Cade Klubnik was the better option. Some of the spots that they put him in, it was it was a no-win situation. You put him in with a lot of pressure on him. In this situation, yeah, there was a little bit of pressure on him. They were already down in the ball game, uh, But against North Carolina, like, you gave him actual time against a bad defense. That North Carolina defense has made a lot of people look like Heisman Trophy contenders. I, I look at what is going on with Clemson, and I'm, I'm very curious going forward if Dabo will make this mistake again. Uh, We're going to talk about the portal. We're going to talk about all kinds of things. But, I mean, you look at this. Clemson lost in their last game of the regular season. Ohio State lost in their last game of the regular season. TCU lost in their conference championship game. Uh, Alabama lost in early November. Granted, it was on the road, but whatever, right? None of these teams deserved to be in. As far as the rankings are concerned... Uh, let's go on to pull that up, and I'll, I'll take a look at what is actually... Who who in this top 10 really deserved to be there? Uh, Utah was number 8. They were 10-3. and three. Kansas State, number 9, 10-3. USC is top 10. They were 11-2. and two. Penn State, 10-2. and two. Washington, 10-2 at number 12. Uh, maybe, maybe, just maybe, this is the one year where the BCS would have fixed everything. Just saying. That's what the CP and CFP did to me this year. Uh, do we really need 12 teams in the playoff? Eh, maybe not. Maybe not. All right. We will move along from there. I want to talk about the top five most interesting bowl matchups for this year, at least for me early in this, right? The top five most interesting bowl matchups to me. We'll start off with number five. The Armed Forces Bowl. And that is Air Force against Baylor. If you're Baylor, you know, you go 6-6, six and six, Dave Aranda uh, making a change at defensive coordinator. Like, there's, there's just a lot to figure out with what is happening with the Bears right now. And still a pretty good coaching job by Aranda and that bunch, uh, Jeff Grimes, etc. But if you're wanting to get extra bowl practices, do you really want to do it against a triple option team? Like, that, that just sounds like an absolute nightmare. To me, uh, this I, Baylor opened up as like a six and a half point favorite. It's an interesting spot, just a very, very interesting spot. Uh, Air Force has been playing significantly better as of late. I'm very curious what Baylor's going to try and accomplish with this ball game. Are they going to try and win, or are they just going to use the practices? That's what I want to know. Number four, the New Mexico Bowl. That's right, BYU and SMU. If you remember the 1980 Holiday Bowl, I am not that old. However, I have watched a tape of that. That's I, I've I've watched multiple times that ball game because it was so incredible. You should go back and watch it. Really, uh, th- these teams have only met like three times. This could be interesting because I, you remember the SMU Houston game from earlier this year where nobody was able to get a stop, and I think the game ended like seventy-seven to sixty-three or whatever it was. 
I, you could have another one like this because I don't believe either one of these defenses is going to be able to get a stop here. Uh, but that's that's just a fun ball game. That's I mean that one's really going to be a lot of fun. Number three, the Alamo Bowl, Washington and Texas. What is the motivation for either one of these teams? Washington had USC won the Pac-12 title. Washington might have been in line to go to the Rose Bowl. How much does that mean? Is this a is this a disappointment for them? And with Texas, uh, you're going to the Alamo Bowl. You're not going to the Sugar Bowl or the Orange Bowl or the Cotton Bowl or whatever. Uh, this this one is a little bit less than what they really wanted to try and accomplish. What do they do here? So you're looking, you're trying to maybe play psychologist a little bit. Um, you know, big news with Washington. We'll talk about that here in a little while as well. Number two, the intriguing matchup here. Tulane against USC. And I don't know that Caleb Williams is going to play in this ball game because of the uh, the hamstring injury that he suffered uh, in the Pac-12 title game. That one's going to be a lot of fun to watch and see because USC cannot stop anybody. Tajay Spears may have an afternoon. I mean, he may just have uh, an NFL type of day, right, to where he is going to look absolutely fantastic. He has been beating up everybody. Like, you saw him do it against UCF, almost 200 yards rushing again. That's that's going to be a lot of fun to see exactly how USC shows up in that ball game. Uh, number one for me, the most interesting ball game or the most interesting bowl game to me is Troy and UTSA, and it's on that first weekend. I mean, it is super early, and the Cure Bowl, like that's they've had some really really good matchups. I believe the Cure Bowl was Liberty against undefeated Coastal Carolina not that long ago. I mean, it is an absolute Awesome, awesome spot. And you got two top 25 teams here. In Troy and UTSA, you got one really good defense, one really good offense, and the other two, the other two sides of the ball are starting to pick up the slack a little bit. These are two great coaches. I am excited. I am excited about that. We'll talk about all of the other bowl games, of course, over on the BetUS College Football Show. I will uh, do some analysis on all of the games here as well. But, uh... But yeah, make sure you're subscribed here. Make sure you are subscribed over there as well. Uh, if you have not already, again, like the video for me, subscribe to the channel, and um, and yeah, thank you guys. Subscribe to the podcast as well. Uh, leave a nice five-star review over there. Let's do quick reactions on the, uh, the conference championship games. Quick reactions for the conference championship games. I did not get to do them on Sunday uh, because we were up and traveling at like 6 a.m., on uh, on Sunday morning, so I had to come back and get the toddler who had strep throat, etc. It's just a complete disaster. Complete disaster with that. We'll start off on Friday. Um, we're not going to talk Buffalo Akron, uh, although that went exactly the way that I thought it would. Um, let's start with the Conference USA title game. UTSA 48, North Texas 27. Uh, we'll talk about Seth Luttrell in just a little bit, but you look at what UTSA did on offense. Frank Harris, 32 out of 37 passing, 341 yards, four touchdowns here. Uh, Barnes, the running back, 28 carries, 175 yards. And then Zachary Franklin, the wide receiver, had 10 receptions for 144 yards and three touchdowns. They put on an absolute show. North Texas was going to have to be able to score to keep up in this ballgame, and they couldn't do it early, and they really couldn't do it late either. They they tried their best to, to hang with them but they don't have the dudes that UTSA's got. The talent disparity here was kind of shocking. Uh, you could tell when UTSA wants to turn it on, they just turn it on. Frank Harris is an absolute dude. So I, I was pumped about that one. Cheers to UTSA for getting that one. Uh, Utah and USC. I bet on Utah on the Bet US show, but I did not envision it going that way. But that does go to show you exactly what the issue is whenever USC does not have Caleb Williams at full strength. Like, that that entire team is a one-man show. And, and that is not disrespect to that defense or that offense or whatever. We know that the defense is not very good. They, they certainly could not tackle in that game. That was, that was an epic underperformance there. Just brutal of that defense to not be able to tackle anybody. The whole ball game. Just brutal. And when Caleb Williams cannot run around, that offense ain't great either. 
right? Without that one key cog, Utah just did whatever they wanted to do with them. That fourth quarter was brutal. Um, this game was 17-17 to 17 at the half. Uh, I know some guys that actually <laughs> that actually bet uh, Utah plus 14 and a half live line when this game got to 17-3, to three, and they did it before Caleb Williams got hurt. And I, I was, it looked like USC might be about to run them out of the building, and then the injury happens, and Utah comes back, ties it at the half. Like, this was an incredible showing by Kyle Whittingham's team, uh, they they have not been able to do exactly what they wanted to this year, but props to Utah. That's another future that we hit on the Bet U.S. College Football Show, uh, where I had Utah winning the Pac-12 this year. I think it was plus four hundred something like that. Oh no no no, it was like plus two twenty five or plus two whatever it was. Uh, but regardless, that's another one uh, that we hit over there. And so we we hit quite a few of those. Uh, moving over to Saturday, um, we'll start with I guess the SEC championship. Georgia, number one in the country, beat LSU 50-30. Garrett Nussmeyer threw for nearly 300 yards. He was 15 out of uh, 27 passing, had two touchdowns in this game. Uh, Milton, the running back for Georgia, eight carries, 113 yards. That that should kind of just tell you everything that you need to know about this one. Uh, Malik Neighbors from LSU did have five receptions for 128 yards. It it honestly looks like um, if, if LSU had run Nussmeyer this entire season, then I think they might would have been in a better position in this ball game. The fact that they were able to put up 30 points on Georgia's defense is kind of surprising. Now, granted, they were down 35 to 10 at the half, so they played catch up the entire ball game. But this was this was a pretty decent showing by LSU, even if they did not cover the spread here. Uh, Nussmeyer looks like the real deal, so I'm I'm curious to see what he's going to look like next year. Uh, Jaden Daniels can come back for a season. I'm real curious. Is he going to be a grad transfer? Is Nussmeyer going to transfer out? Like, what, what's going to happen with that quarterback room? Because they might be better with Garrett Nussmeyer. Just saying. And Georgia does what they always do. I mean, they just they destroyed this team. Just destroyed them. Um, yeah, it was they they blocked a field goal. They they did all kind of things. Uh, the Big Ten championship game: Michigan forty three, Purdue twenty two. You will never convince me that Jim Harbaugh does not know what the spread is. There was no reason for him to score that late touchdown other than to cover the number, period. Purdue had to kick four field goals, I believe, inside the red zone or at least in, in scoring position. Um, it, it, that's That was the ball game. That's all she wrote. I mean, you see that it was 7-7 seven to seven in the first quarter, and then you see Purdue kicked, you know, two field goals in the second quarter. Uh, third quarter, kicked another field goal, kicked two more field goals in the fourth quarter. That was it. This is a second-half team for Michigan. Donovan Edwards is just ridiculous. 25 carries, 185 yards, one touchdown. Aiden O'Connell uh, played well, played really well, uh, but it was not enough in this situation. Moving along, the Big 12 championship. Of course, Kansas State gets that win in overtime. Um, you look at what how the game was going. Max Duggan played his absolute heart out. This was a fantastic, fantastic job by him. And I... The whole situation of not sneaking the quarterback. Sonny Dykes did talk about this afterwards. Uh, but that fourth and one or third and one, they didn't feel comfortable with Max Duggan because he was banged up. So they didn't feel comfortable with him sneaking the ball. So that's why they called the, the plays the way that they did. I can understand it. Uh, but then it, it allowed Kansas State to just kick a field goal to win the game in overtime. And that's a massive spot. When, when we get to a 12-team playoff, that's a massive, massive deal. Because TCU would no longer be hosting uh, a home game or they would no longer be getting a bye or whatever it may be. That's a big situation. That's a big field goal in that game. Uh, Max Duggan coming back late in that game and, and getting that two-point conversion, et cetera. I mean, it is just, he is an absolute stud. Uh, 18 out of 36 passing, 251 yards, one touchdown. Uh, Deuce Vaughn uh, broke out in this game, 26 carries, 130 yards, one touchdown. Yeah, cheers. And then Quentin Johnson, I mean, four receptions, 139 yards. Like this, this was, the Big 12 title game is always, always good. Always good. Uh, the ACC title game, Clemson 39, North Carolina 10. Cade Klubnick, they brought him in. He replaced DJ Uyongalele, who was headed to the transfer portal. At DJ uh, started two of five. Well, Cade came in and went 20 out of 24, 279 yards, one touchdown. Just nuts. Just nuts. Uh, 
Clemson just demolished these guys and and really may have cost themselves a uh, a shot at the playoff by not playing Klubnik earlier. Oh, well. The AAC title game, Tulane won that one over UCF, 45-28. to Tajay Spears, 22 carries, 199 yards. Uh, Michael Pratt, 20 out of 33, 294, or excuse me, 394 with four touchdowns. Like, Tulane did what they wanted to. And, man, it looked a little hairy late because it looked like they were going to let UCF get back in this ballgame. Scored two touchdowns late. No problems whatsoever. Won the game by 17. Very, very simple. Uh, early that day, there was the MAC championship. Toledo got a win over Ohio 17-7. And the difference there, I believe, is Daquan Finn played for Toledo. Easy enough. That defense was always going to be good enough to slow down Ohio so long as they didn't have Rourke playing at quarterback. And that's exactly what they did. Just don't beat yourself. Uh, Coastal Carolina loses 45-26 to to Troy in the Sun Belt Championship. That one, uh, Troy beat the absolute breaks off this. It was 31 to nothing before half. It ended up uh, 31 to 7 at the half. But, uh, but Grayson McCall did play. He looked pretty good. He was 29 out of 41, 319 yards, three touchdowns. But, uh, but Troy is just, whew, they got some dudes. John Sumrall, incredible first season, wins the Sun Belt Championship. Cheers to him. The Mountain West Championship. Fresno wins 28-16, and it's exactly what I said on the show last week. It's what I said on the BetUS show. Boise had not seen a quarterback like this. Jake Hayner, 17 out of 27, 184 yards. Jordan Mims, 25 carries, 83 yards. And that Fresno defense was pretty good. Like, Boise State had feasted on just a bad Mountain West, and Hayner uh, was able to carve them up at least a little bit. And, yeah, Boise had not played anybody. This good. And from what, I think people kind of wrote off Fresno early in the year in that time span when Hayner was out because they lost four straight games. But they only lost one in the Mountain West. They were 7-1 and one in the Mountain West. So now, of course, 8-1 and one with a Mountain West championship. But Tedford, first year back on the job, wins a conference championship. Not too shabby. Not too shabby. All right. Let's... uh. Let's take a break. On the other side, we're going to talk about Scott Satterfield. We are going to talk about Deion Sanders. We're going to talk about Jamie Chadwell. we got all kinds of things to discuss, so stick right here. Let's check out some things you should know about. College football is back, and BetUS TV has you covered. Every Tuesday and Wednesday at 1 p.m. Eastern, we've got expert game analysis to help you make informed decisions before kickoff, only on the BetUS TV College football channel. Visit winningcureseverything.com to find everything you need to know about us, including full shows in video or podcast form, gambling picks, merch, the gear we use, and more. If you want more content from me, Gary, visit betustv.com. I host the How to Gamble on Sports Show and, from August through January, the BetUS College Football Show. You can subscribe to both on YouTube. If you haven't already, subscribe to the podcast on Apple, Spotify, or whatever's your favorite podcast app. And if your app allows it, leave a five-star written review. Visit the Winning Cures Everything web store to get all kinds of football shirts, hats, hoodies, mugs, and more. Visit winningcureseverything.com slash store to see what all we've added. And now, back to the show. All right, Louisville's Scott Satterfield has taken the Cincinnati head coaching job. That's right, he is the new head man of the Cincinnati Bearcats. And yes, these two teams play each other in the Fenway Bowl in just a few weeks. How's that for awkward, right? The Fenway Bowl got canceled the last two years because of uh, COVID uh, situations and whatnot. But uh, this go-round, the Louisville coach is leaving to be the Cincinnati coach, which is strange obviously, because, one, these two teams used to be rivals when they were both in the American, right? Uh, and really, way back when they were both in Conference USA and et cetera, et cetera, much more so on the basketball side than football, but either way. But Satterfield, you know, a lot of people questioning this morning, why on earth would he do this? Well, at Cincinnati, we know that they are committed to the football program. Uh, Louisville is still somewhat considered a basketball school, Right? Now, I understand all the situation going on with Kenny Payne right now. That's not a very good team right now. But that program 
is the front porch. The basketball program is the front porch of Louisville's university, even though the football program makes the majority of the money. Uh, the other side of this is Satterfield has kind of been on the hot seat for years at this point. Like, they have been talking about wanting him gone every game. It feels like he is coaching for his job there. And he was told by the current AD that he was going to be retained. But there was no extension in sight, and he's only got two years left on his deal. So can you blame him for looking out for uh, maybe a little more job security? I, I don't blame him at all for that. At, you, at Cincinnati, this is a good thing. You get a guy that has uh, Power 5 experience, a guy that joined a football program that is uh, that had been on the back end of a transition. Now you're going to hire him in to be in the middle of a transition over to the Big 12. Um, this is a guy that built an incredible foundation at Appalachian State, I guess, or Appalachian, however you want to say it. Uh, he built an incredible, incredible foundation for what App State has been able to do for years and years, even after he left. And at Louisville, it just never felt like there was any ground for him to stand on, even though they've done an incredible job recruiting. I think this kind of tells you, though, he knew that he wasn't the one getting those recruits in. And this has been something that's been rumored about for quite some time, but Louisville wanted to push their NIL stuff forward a little bit. They had a five-star coming in. I think they were number 18 at 247 or Rivals or whatever it is. Like, a really, really good recruiting class for that football program. Why would you go ahead and leave it? Well, because... All that's doing is setting you up to where if you don't do something with those recruits in year one, you're probably going to lose your job next year because it's not like they came to you with an offer for an extension. Um, and, and so with all this, Louisville is now looking for a head coach. We're back on Jeff Brom watch, right? That's what we're sitting at. We, we are sitting on Jeff Brom watch, and I mean, I'm very curious. Uh, He's not told anybody at Purdue, at least according to uh, Greg Doyle and and other people around that Purdue program, I'm curious what he ends up doing here. Like, do you, you just won the Big Ten West, but it was obvious that you were not the best team in the Big Ten. Divisions are about to go away. What is going to happen with with that situation? Does he want to go back to Louisville where maybe it's a little bit easier to win in the ACC? maybe you're going to get a lot more money. What what are you looking at? What do you want your life to be? That's a, that's a big-time question. Um, let me tell you about Flow Sports right quick. Flow Sports, home to over 25,000 sports matches every single year. And, uh, they, I mean, they've got MMA. they got Division Three football. They, they're the ones that actually had the New Mexico State Valparaiso game from this past Saturday, one in which I covered, New Mexico State minus 31 and a half. Chef's kiss, perfect. Uh, But you can only watch it on Flow Sports. There's a link in the description. Make sure that you go and check it out. Flowsports.tv is where you need to go. Those guys are fantastic. They treat us well. They will treat you well also. Go and check them out. Flow Sports. Deion Sanders. Oh, my goodness. Oh, my goodness gracious, Deion. Colorado has hired Coach Prime to be their new head football coach. And... The contract is a five-year deal worth $29.5 million. That's pretty good. Nearly $6 million a year. But the Colorado AD has already told the media, which I am shocked that he was willing to admit this. Rick George said that they don't have the money yet, but they are confident that they will. Everything will be fine. And so that's just one piece of this puzzle, right? You see all the stuff breaking on Saturday. You know, Jackson State wins uh, wins the SWAC title and just in blowout fashion. You kind of knew it was coming. They're undefeated this year. Like, that's a really, really good team. Uh, they're supposed to go play, I believe, in the Heritage Bowl in two weeks. So that's going to be interesting. Like, is Dion going to coach that? I'm uh, very curious about that. Uh, the other part of this is the fact that at the introductory press conference and when Dion Sanders was, of course, meeting with the team, He brought up multiple times about how he's bringing his baggage. And uh, he can, you know, he's he's telling these kids to go ahead and and transfer because you're probably not going to have a spot because uh, we don't put up with losing. Like all these different things. You need to go and watch the the situation there, Uh, the way that that thing went down. It was mind-blowing. And I understand why he did it. But he has not gotten a chance to coach those guys yet. 
he really hadn't had a chance to break down the film on who could actually be useful to him. Uh, and the way that he went about that, I thought was a little strange. But him talking about uh, Shador Sanders, like introducing his son to uh, that team as, you know, this is your quarterback, and yeah, he's going to have to earn it, but he's coming with me. And Travis Hunter, the number one recruit in the country last year, he's coming with me. And uh, Lewis is coming with me. And et cetera, et cetera, right? Colorado has been notoriously difficult at getting transfers into school there. It's why it was considered such an incredibly difficult job because you cannot overturn the roster overnight. You can't do it within a season. You have to wait a while. You have to recruit really, really well because the academic side doesn't always work with the football side. And it appears that that is all just out the window. Uh, unless there's something that I'm missing or or Dion is missing, uh, maybe they have just opened this thing up to where they want to be a player again in college football. And if they do, you know that the former coaches have to be irate about this, right? Now, Mel Tucker got a much better deal at Michigan State. That's no, that's no question. And he probably would have left for that job anyway. But he told you what the difficulties were there. Uh, then you got Carl Durrell coming in, and he can't get anything done. And when you've got guys that leave, you can't replace them. Like it's just it's very, very difficult to do in Boulder. And yet, Deion Sanders comes in on day one. He's talking about bringing in all these transfer guys. I'm curious to see what's going to happen here. I want to know what Colorado ends up being. Uh, but, man, this is... This was strange. This was very, very strange. <laughs> I do think that they're going to be really good so long as they can get all this other stuff done. Uh, but Deion Sanders, I mean, he is already making a splash. This uh, this should be a lot of fun to see what goes on in Boulder. The next one on the docket here that I want to touch on would be Liberty hiring Jamie Chadwell. Now, the Coastal Carolina coach has been in the running for multiple P5 jobs over the last few years. Yes, they lost the Sun Belt title uh, this past weekend, but that was not going to affect his job prospects, right? Jamie Chadwell has a checkered past as far as the NCAA is concerned because of things that went on at Charleston Southern. So there was always going to be that issue, and then, of course, there was the questionable stuff when it comes from the, the country club boosters at whether it be Georgia Tech or South Florida or whoever, right? There are there are other uh, factors into this. I don't think you've got so much to worry about with the NCAA, but it was certainly something that you had to keep an eye on when it comes to Chadwell uh, because of just whatever. And you can Google it yourself. Jamie Chadwell, Charleston Southern, NCAA. Just go and look it up yourself. But uh, he quickly realized that, hey, I am not going to be the top pick for a lot of these jobs that I am uh, going out there for, whether it be because of my mullet or uh, the way that I've, it, maybe the fact that I have not proven that I can win at the same level without a, a quarterback like Grayson McCall, which, I mean, is Lincoln Riley proven that? I mean, well, that's another question. Uh, but he, I, I like Jamie Chadwell. I think that he is uh, an incredible motivator. I think that he is an incredible coach. I think he can scheme with the best of them. And in this situation, like, it makes perfect sense for him to go. One, he's, he's kind of a faith-based guy, right? He's talked about it on multiple podcasts, et cetera. And, and he fits in really well with what Liberty wants to do, right? Uh, faith-based football program, I guess you could say. He is getting paid $4 million a season, guaranteed. And he's going to be in Conference USA. And the new version of Conference USA where, I mean you may not have a ton of competition here. Like, this sounds like a pretty good gig. Uh, he's still going to be able to recruit. He knows that area of the country pretty well. I think this is a home run hire for Liberty. I think it's a pretty good job for Jamie Chadwell as well. Uh, you've already seen at Liberty, Hugh Freeze go off to be the Auburn head coach. You have seen Hugh Freeze be able to beat SEC teams, be able to beat ACC teams at Liberty. They are not lacking for financial support for that football program. They will be able to hire assistants. 
they will be able to do basically whatever he wants to. And the competition that he faces on a week-in and week-out basis is uh, minimal, to say the least. Like, for Jamie Chadwell, this is the perfect spot, right? Because you're going to be able to win a lot. Nobody will be able to deny that you are a winner. They may question some things, but they cannot deny it. And, yeah, this is I think this is perfect for both sides, right? If, if Jamie Chadwell was not getting sniffs from those, those Power 5 jobs, What's, what's the best next step? Go to a smaller league, making more money, where you're never going to have to worry about the support for your football program. Cheers to it. Cheers to Liberty. Cheers to Jamie Chadwell, etc. cetera. Uh, on the back side, we're going to talk about FAU. We're going to talk about USF, North Texas, Oregon, hiring an offensive coordinator, all kinds of things. Uh, CFP officially expanding. All, I mean, we still got a lot to discuss, uh, but we'll do that on the backside. Let's check out some things you should know about. Follow the show on Twitter at Winning Cures, and you can follow Gary at Gary WCE. You can also follow on Facebook. Got your own podcast or web show? Looking to start one, or you're just curious how we look and sound so good? Well, we've got all the gear that we use listed on our gear page on the website. And if you order using our links, you'll be supporting the show too. Subscribe on YouTube to get not only full Winning Cures Everything shows, but individual segments and other goodies as well. We're over 6,000 subscribers, and our goal by the end of the year is 7,500. If you're interested in advertising on a show that reaches over 80,000 unique football fans per month during the season, send an email to Gary at winningcureseverything.com, and we'll put together a plan that best fits you or your business. And now, back to the show. All right, let me go ahead and tell you right quick. Uh, again, if you've not already, make sure that you go and sign up over at BetUS. That is your one-stop shop uh, for all of your sports gambling needs. But there is a link in the description. Make sure that you go and check it out. $50 free play, no deposit required. All you got to do is sign up by clicking that link that's in the description below. So go and check that out. If you're listening to the podcast, we got it on there as well. Go and take advantage of it while you can. All right, FAU has hired, that's right, Florida Atlantic, has hired Tom Herman, the former Texas coach, the former uh, Houston coach, and the former Ohio State offensive coordinator as their new head coach. Herman's name had been brought up with Colorado. It had been brought up with Arizona State. It was brought up with uh, Tulsa, like at several other spots. It, I never heard it brought up with FAU, but... Maybe we should have thought about that because FAU tends to do this frequently, right? They go out and they hire the coach that's got a name, and it's somebody that is uh, that is trying to not necessarily rehab, but somebody that's trying to step their way back up to the big leagues. Somebody that used to be a head coach at a, a power, like a big time Power Five school, and they move on from there. Well, Tom Herman gets to go live in Boca, and he's I, I haven't seen the details of the contract. I would imagine he'll make what Willie Taggart made or Lane Kiffin before. You're making well over a million dollars a year, and you get to live in paradise, as they call it. And it really don't get much better than Boca. I mean, it's <laughs> there's there's much worse things in this world. Uh, there were a lot of people on Twitter that hit me up that said, man, uh, my, how he's fallen. Like, unbelievable. And I said, fallen? Like, it seems to me he's doing all right. You go to Boca Raton, and, and you get over a million dollars a year to coach football, yeah, that's all right. And don't forget, FAU will be a member of the American Athletic Conference next year. So this is a program that is on the rise. Tom Herman has a chance to make a big splash here. It's pretty easy to recruit to FAU. I mean, you go look at the pictures. This place is absolutely insane. So cheers to Tom Herman. Cheers to FAU. I think this is a pretty good marriage that's going to work. Tom Herman was not a bad football coach. But I think this is a good spot for him for sure. Let's move over to the other side of the state in the same conference. USF, South Florida. The Bulls have hired Alex Golesh, that is the Tennessee offensive coordinator, uh, as their new head coach. The AD Michael Kelly announced that uh, on Sunday. Um, this was shocking to me. Like, just absolutely shocking. Um uh, this is the quote. It says, We're thrilled to welcome Coach Golesh as the uh, leader of our new program. Hopefully I'm saying that name right. 
Uh, he's a dynamic coach and recruiter who is relentless in pursuit of excellence, as evidenced by his outstanding track record of elevating numerous programs. He also happens to be one of the most creative and successful offensive minds in college football. Uh, Alex has worked his way up through the, uh, through the college ranks, has been a key part of successful program building at numerous stops, and has developed perhaps the most fearsome offensive attack in college football today. Now, here is what scares you, right? Uh, this guy has, has been a coach for uh, 19 years. He graduated at Ohio State, spent time at Illinois, Iowa State, and Toledo. Uh, it said that he was a candidate for the Cincinnati job. Do you want to bring in a coach that worked under the guy that does the thing that this guy is supposed to be good at? <laughs> Maybe there's an easier way to say this. At Tennessee, they run Josh Heupel's offense. Alex was uh, in charge of running Heupel's offense. So when when he's saying uh, he's been a key part of successful program building and he has developed perhaps the most fearsome offensive attack in college football today, did he develop that or did Josh Heupel develop that? See, that's that's where it gets tricky. And don't get me wrong. I have no idea whether or not this hire is going to be successful. But to say that that Tennessee offensive attack is Alex Golesh's alone is just not factually accurate. So this could be really, really good. And obviously, you can sell this to incoming recruits, and you're going to have a ton of speed down in Florida. We know that. He is going to have a ton of speed to be able to get this done. I'm just curious whether or not this actually translates. It translates. That's what I'm curious about. So, I, I can't say it's a bad hire. I don't really know. I'm just curious to see how it's going to go. That's what I would like to see. North Texas has fired Seth Luttrell. And I find the timing incredibly convenient. <laughs> Ren Baker was just hired as the new AD at West Virginia. And... As soon as he is gone and Seth Luttrell loses the Conference USA Championship game to UTSA, that's when they decide to let him go. Now, part of this is the fact that he went 7-5 and five in consecutive seasons, right? Or I guess 6-6 six and six last year, whatever it was. Uh, but barely squeaked into a bowl game in consecutive seasons. Austin Oni has been there for what feels like a decade at this point. Uh, the offense is pretty good. The defense uh, has its moments. I guess you could say the defense is what they leaned on last year. Defensive running game. This year it was the passing game. Um, they won in a lot of different ways. And I do find it incredibly convenient that as soon as the AD is gone, that might have been the only thing protecting Latrell. The boosters find a way to get Latrell out of his job and go out, and they are hunting for uh, whatever it is that they are looking for. They, they are heading into the AAC as well. Uh, you know, we brought up FAU. North Texas wants to be competitive against teams like SMU. They just do. That's going to be their rival in this new league. They are expected to compete in this league. They don't think Latrell's got it anymore. It was not that long ago that Latrell was up for, like, the Kansas State job, like, multiple jobs, and, man, it just fell off a cliff. Now, it looked like he was starting to get that thing back, but, yeah, uh, impatience. Impatience. That's what happened. And you can understand it because once you lose faith that a coach is going to be able to get that next level or get to that next level, you've lost everything that you're selling. Everything. So, North Texas, I think the uh, the watch here is Justin Fuente, right? Uh, former TCU offensive coordinator. Uh, was at Oklahoma. Uh, then went to Memphis, built the program there. Hey, he's been in this league. He knows. No, things did not go well at Virginia Tech, but he doesn't really know that part of the country. That's how you can sell this thing. Justin Fuente, he's a Texas guy. He, he's Texas and, and Oklahoma, and he will be able to find the guys, and he'll be able to build this program the same way that he built that Memphis program that is still maybe not thriving, but is still extremely competitive and is going to be one of the top teams left in this version of the AAC. I, I don't blame North Texas for doing it. I do find it incredibly funny that they waited until Ren Baker was gone. So, uh, so we'll see. Is it Fuente or is it somebody else? If you if you have an inkling of what you think they're going to try and do, toss it in the comments. Or you can always reach out to me on Twitter, at GaryWCE, of course. 
Uh, Oregon. Let's talk about the Ducks for just a minute. This one should be very interesting. Oregon hired UTSA offensive coordinator Willie Stein. Now, the interesting part about this is we know that Oregon is a nationally recruiting uh, team. They, they don't just stick with the talent that's in the uh, Pacific Northwest, right? <laughs> I mean, you, I don't know how competitive you would really be if that's what you did. Uh, but this guy is replacing Kenny Dillingham. Uh, he has been in charge of the passing game at UTSA for the last three seasons. Like, since Jeff Trailer got there, he's been the passing game coordinator. This year, he was the offensive coordinator. And you saw what that offense did in that CUSA title game. I mean, they just went bananas on North Texas. Um, he was, once upon a time, the offensive coordinator and the associate head coach, or the assistant head coach, whatever you want to call it, at Lake Travis High School in Austin, Texas. Oregon has always had recruiting ties to Texas, dating back to Chip Kelly and uh, uh, just every everybody else that has been in Oregon. I think this is a smart move. If you're going to lose Kenny Dillingham, you want somebody that's going to be fun, innovative, uh, that's going to know how to run the football while also being able to design some plays that get guys cheap yards. And that's what UTSA was really, really good at. They were able to get guys in space and get them the ball where they can move to where it makes the job of the quarterback a little bit easier. I think he's going to do the exact same thing here. And I think that this is going to open up uh, another recruiting pipeline into Texas, especially down at Lake Travis in that area. Like, there's a reason why Jeff Trailer hired the guy. Jeff Trailer was known as this. Like, he knows Texas high school. So now you're bringing in a young guy that's really innovative on the offensive side that understands how to recruit. I think this is a smart move by Dan Lanning. He has been knocking these hires out of the park. We'll see if this one works. I think it will. Uh, but cheers to Dan Lanning. Cheers to Oregon for hiring a, uh, a really uh, impressive up-and-coming offensive mind in college football. The college football playoff. Hey, you know what? Hold on. Let me tell you something. The Valtimary Surf Company. They are fantastic. Let me tell you. Absolutely fantastic. Go and check them out. They've got collegiate town apparel, and they've got surf company shirts. I own two of them. They are awesome. The material is super comfortable. Incredibly, incredibly comfy to wear. Uh, it's ValtimarySurfCo.com. You can use the promo code Gary10 to get 10% off of your order. So go ahead and check them out. Valtimary Surf Company. Um, there's a link in the description. Go click that. Use the promo code Gary10, and uh, and you will not be disappointed. I'm telling you, go and check it out. Even if you don't buy anything, just go click the link and and have a look because I think you're going to really like these guys. Along with that, thank you guys again for consuming the show, for watching, for listening, however you do it. Share the show out. Tell your friends about it. You, you've already been telling your friends, and we see those in the numbers. I mean, the numbers continue to grow. Uh, we have gone well past uh, our goal for the season, and that's because of you guys. You guys are subscribing. You're clicking the like button, uh, which if you've not already done so, go ahead and click that like button for me. Uh, but yeah, yeah. if you've not already, subscribe to the channel, subscribe to the podcast, leave a nice five-star review, etc. Uh, and again, if you're watching from somewhere, which <laughs> I would assume you have to be, uh, put your town in the chat. I want to know where you're watching from. If you're just clicking in, I want to know where you guys are actually watching the show from. Um, the college football playoff is officially expanding in 2024. That's right. The Rose Bowl saw the writing on the wall. And they said, all right, if we want to maintain having a game that has any kind of relevance, any kind of meaning whatsoever going forward, we are going to have to just agree to whatever it is that they tell us. And so the CFP said, we need you to sign this sheet of paper that is going to let us expand the field from four teams to 12 teams starting in 2024. So after next season, that will be the last one with a four-team playoff. Going forward, after next year, it will be 12 from here on out. The six highest-rated conference champions all get uh, all get in, and then six wild cards. The four highest-rated conference champions all get a bye, and then everybody else gets seated appropriately. It's going to be interesting. Um, you've got the first four games are uh, home games for the higher-rated teams, the higher-seeded teams. Then you've got four quarterfinal games, in bowl games, you've got two semifinal games in bowl games, and then whatever the CFP site will be. In 2024, it is Atlanta. In 2025, it will be Miami. So they found a way to make the dates work. 
It's going to be later in January now. Uh, I wanted to pull up. I probably should have done this before I actually started recording. But if we were going to do the 12-team playoff this year, uh, it would be different. Very, very different. Uh, Because, remember, you had upsets in conference championship games. You had very interesting uh, situations. Right now, obviously, Georgia and Michigan would be the top two seeds. They would get bias. Um, let's see. What would the... Uh, let's see. CFP look like with 12. Now, uh, this... Yeah, sporting news. Here we go. All right, so the way that this would work. Georgia would have a bye, and then Tennessee would play Kansas State, number eight, number nine. Uh, that game would be in Knoxville to head into the next uh, situation. Utah would have been a top four seed. They would have gotten a bye. TCU would be playing Tulane for a chance to play against Utah in whatever bowl game. And TCU would have a home playoff game. So that's, I guess that's good. Uh, On the other side, you would have Alabama hosting USC for a chance to play Michigan in whatever bowl game. And you would have Ohio State hosting Penn State with a chance to play Clemson in that one. That's right. Clemson winning the ACC would have been a top four seed in the playoff because of their championship. That's how nuts this is going to be. Every game is going to have meaning. Everything is going to be a lot of fun. So, yeah, I'm not totally sold that there's a lot of teams that deserve to be in the playoff. Uh, But if you want games to have a ton of meaning, if you want to bring in a ton of viewership, etc., give people something to cheer for, something to watch, this is how you do it. So, cheers to them. Uh, for getting this thing done, uh, it's it's going to be it's going to be interesting. It's definitely going to be interesting. Michael Penix is returning to Washington next year. I could have sworn to you that he was gone to the NFL, but he is in fact returning. Uh, I am very curious about this to see what in the world is going to happen. Um, but I I think he's an immediate Heisman front runner. Like, this just seems like the perfect uh, spot, the perfect uh, whatever you want to call it. Um, it. It's exactly what you would think, right? This is just massive. They're going to be the favorites to win the Pac-12 next year. Uh, it's it's huge, just absolutely huge. All right, let's talk, uh, let's talk transfer portal madness right quick before we get out of here. Uh, just to give you an idea of what all is going on, because we'll we'll talk more when the dust settles. DJ Uyongalele, the quarterback at Clemson, he has entered the transfer portal. Hudson Card, the backup quarterback at Texas, he has entered the transfer portal. Along with that, surprisingly, NC State quarterback Devin Leary is looking for a new home. A uh, little bit surprising that he decided that he was going to leave. Uh, but when you start looking at the ACC, maybe it's not that surprising. Everybody is moving out of there. Uh, you got Brennan Armstrong, the quarterback from Virginia. He's leaving. You've got Phil Dracovich, the quarterback at Boston College. He's headed back to Pitt now uh, to go and be with his former offensive coordinator, uh, Signetti, Frank Signetti. So, yeah, this, this is going to be interesting. Austin Sogner, the tight end at South Carolina, he's going to be a grad transfer. Uh, he just came over from Oklahoma not that long ago. He only caught 20 passes for like 210 yards this year. I think that he thought he was going to be a bigger part of that offense, and he just wouldn't. Uh, Dante Thornton, the wide receiver at Oregon. Uh, We already talked about Jeff Sims on here, the quarterback at uh, Georgia Tech. Graham Mertz, the quarterback at Wisconsin, has put his name in the the portal. Keaton Slovis at Pitt, he is looking for a new place. Of course, he transferred over from USC. He played there this year. I think he realized very quickly that, oh, this is not the same Pitt offense, and they don't really want me to throw the ball. I think one of the guys that you're not going to hear talked about a ton but is going to be a massive pickup for somebody is Austin Reed, the quarterback at Western Kentucky. Uh, He led the FBS in passing this year. Oh, no, he was second in passing yards, 4,247. He was second in touchdown passes, 36, second in completions, 353. Uh, So he played at Division II North Florida uh, two years ago and then joined Western Kentucky. Now he is moving on to somewhere else. Uh, Let's see. We talked about Luke Altmaier. We talked about Malik Hornsby. Oh, Justin Flo, the linebacker from Oregon is now in the portal. That is something to pay attention to. I mean, this is this is kind of nuts. Uh, Spencer Sanders, uh, just about an hour ago, the quarterback at uh, Oklahoma State, I did not even realize that he still had uh, playing time. I didn't know that he had any eligibility left, uh, but he is going to be 
entering the transfer portal. So, eh, we'll we'll see what happens here. I'm I'm a little shocked at some of this. Uh, Javion Cohen, the uh, tackle for Alabama, uh, has started like the last two years, if I'm not mistaken. He has decided that he is going to transfer as well. Uh, you got you got a lot of dudes that are standing out right now. I'm I'm real curious how all this ends up playing out. And that this is why I was saying that we need to, I'm not going to do like a full breakdown. Oh, Donovan Smith, Texas Tech. Yeah, he's going somewhere else. Whatever G5 team he ends up on, I would imagine that uh, they're going to be a lot of fun. They're going to be a lot of fun. If he goes to Western Kentucky, goodness gracious. Just uh, unbelievable. Unbelievable. So, yeah, there are a lot of uh, big-time guys already in the portal. Uh, Fentrell Cypress uh, from Virginia, the cornerback, that's one to pay attention to. Uh, Let's see, J.Q. Hardaway, uh, cornerback from Cincinnati. Let's see. I mean, you got some... You got some real, real dudes, a bunch of guys from Texas A&M. Uh, Dante Cephas from Kent State, wide receiver. Like He's going to be up there. Um, Allie Jennings, the wide receiver from uh, Old Dominion. He is going to be uh, somewhere. He's going somewhere. Uh, but he's going to be a huge pickup for somebody. I mean, th- these are the ones that you need to pay attention to, is the ones that uh, maybe weren't uh, outstanding, weren't great. Um or we're just at a lesser school. How's that? They were fantastic at like lower level schools. Uh, what are they going to be when they get somewhere else? That's what I'm curious about. Grant Dubose from Charlotte. Yeah, that's that's going to be a dude. That's going to be a dude. Uh, Mikey Keene, the quarterback from uh, UCF. Where is he going to go? Like uh, he he read the writing on the wall as well. Oh, we didn't even talk about Cade McNamara over the weekend. He chose Iowa. I think we did talk about that a little bit last week, but it was made official over the weekend. Drew Pine, the quarterback from Notre Dame. Blech. I mean, I'm just, I'm spouting out just a ton of names here. There's like 700 dudes already. Like, this is nuts. Uh, so, we'll, we'll see what ends up happening as it, uh, as it continues on. Because, man, this thing is going to go for another two weeks. And we still got signing day coming up in, in two weeks or so. How nuts is this? All right, let's get this show done in under an hour. <laughs> you guys are fantastic. Uh, check out Valtimary Surf Company. Check out Flow Sports. And, of course... Bet U.S. College Football Show. Every Tuesday and Wednesday, 1 p.m. Eastern Time, I host that show. It is just a whole ball of fun. It's so much fun over there. We are doing a good job as far as the numbers go, uh, and and really both numbers, as far as viewers and how we're doing on our picks each week. So go ahead and check it out. Make sure and click the link in the description. If you've not signed up at Bet U.S., make sure you do. Get that $50 free play. No deposit required. Just make sure that you get signed up over at Bet U.S., With that said, subscribe to the podcast. Subscribe to the YouTube channel right here. Make sure that you like the video. On your way out, if you haven't already done so, go ahead and toss in there what city you are watching from. We want to know where you guys are. Uh, You guys know I'm in Memphis. That's the way this thing rolls. So, all right, it's time for us to roll. You guys have been absolutely fantastic. Take care of yourself. Take care of each other. And hopefully, hopefully, all of your tickets cash this week. Thanks for listening to Winning Cures Everything. Make sure and subscribe on YouTube or your favorite podcast app. And make sure to leave a nice five-star review. You can follow Gary on Twitter, at GaryWCE. And the show is at Winning Cures. Be sure to check out the merch in our web store and share the show.